Greetings, everybody. My name is David Heiser, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to a Yale Peabody Museum Research Spotlight. Glad to have you with us today. Um, in my current role as Director of Student Programs, I have the opportunity to interact with lots of graduate students from around the university. Many of them are conducting research that we think you'd be interested in learning about. So we've decided to feature more of them and their work over the next few years using this webinar format of a short talk followed by Q&A. We've disabled the chat, as you may have noticed, um, but if you do have questions, please submit them through the Q&A function that Zoom offers. And speaking of questions, uh, with us today, fielding questions behind the scenes is Mads O'Brien, who just a few days ago completed the requirements for her master's degree from the Yale School of the Environment. So congratulations, Mads. Um, also, this is being recorded in case you want to go back and hear something that you missed or let other people know about it. If this is your first time on uh, to one of our webinars, please be sure to follow us on social media or sign up through the connect box on our homepage so we can let you know about future programs. But today, I'm very pleased to introduce Chloe Chen Krause. Um, Chloe's research combines primate behavioral ecology and conservation biology to investigate human and wildlife coexistence in Southwest Madagascar. By combining behavioral studies of lemur groups with landscape level analyses of lemur distribution, genetic connectivity, and population viability, her project will result in a comprehensive understanding of how an endangered primate species is being impacted by human activities and which activities pose the greatest threats. The ultimate goal of her research is to inform the conservation and management of landscapes that allow for the coexistence of both humans and primates, which is a noble and wonderful goal. So thank you, Chloe, for the research you're doing. Uh, she's currently a Yale Alumni Fellow supporting Yale's Introduction to Biology course sequence, and she's here to tell us about tree-hugging lemurs. So Chloe, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much, David. Are we good with the slides here? Looks good to me. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you to everyone so much for taking the time. I know um, it's late in the afternoon on a Friday. Um, for most of us, we've had uh, Zoom filled weeks already. So um, thanks for sticking around. Um, I promise to try to make this as short and sweet and also as engaging and filled with cute lemur pictures as possible. So as David mentioned, um, my primary research focus has been on conservation with lemurs in Madagascar. Um, but today I'm not going to really be talking about that. I'll be talking about the same lemurs, um, but kind of this side project my colleagues and I have been doing, looking at this very interesting behavior um, in which they engage in this, this tree hugging behavior. So, and I just wanna make a note that this um, study has not yet been published, but is currently under review. Um, so you're getting kind of a sneak preview of our results. Um, and we hope this is out in the scientific literature soon. So uh, this is the species that I study. Um, so this is Burroughs sea faca, which is a critically endangered species of lemur. Um, they are also known for being highly arboreal. They're really specialized to life in the trees. Um, so they have these amazing adaptations for vertical clinging and leaping. They can leap distances of up to 30 feet between trees, uh, which is really quite amazing. Um, so as I said, I've been studying kind of their conservation biology, but then have gotten interested in some of their other behaviors. And so for the last six years, I've been spending quite a lot of time um, down here in Southwest Madagascar at Beza Mahafali Special Reserve. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with Madagascar, it is this relatively large island on the east coast of Madagascar um, that is considered a biodiversity hotspot. So there's um, tons of amazing plant and animal life here. There's also lots of different forest types. So um, as you can see in this map, uh, we have uh, some kind of traditional, what we think of as traditional tropical rainforest in the east of the country, as well as dry forest in the west and spiny forest in the southern part of Madagascar. 
So there's lots of diversity of habitat type. And where I've been conducting my research is kind of in this southwestern area um, where the dry forest meets the spiny forest. So Beza, where I do my work, is kind of like a desert-like habitat. Um, it tends to be very hot and dry. So I'll, send you, I'll show you just um, a little bit of the climate data so you can get a sense of this place. We have a very long dry season that takes up most of the year when there's basically no rain. Uh, followed by a very short wet season that typically lasts from December through March, where um, those are the months in which we're actually getting uh, significant amounts of rain and precipitation. And this graph is showing mean temperature throughout the year, so you can see not only is there seasonality in terms of rainfall, we also have some significant seasonality in terms of temperature. So for much of the year, mean temperatures are quite high, around 30 degrees Celsius, um, but then that kind of dips off in the beginning and middle part of the dry season uh, before it picks back up again. And if we add in here the um, minimum and maximum temperatures, uh, you can see not only is there variability throughout the year, we also have quite a lot of variability just in a given day. Temperatures might be fluctuating um, in the order of like 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and for those of you who are not used to thinking about temperature in terms of Celsius, um, I've put in some little notes here um, and tried to do this throughout the slides of what this looks like in terms of Fahrenheit. So for these lowest temperatures, we're talking around 40 degrees, 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and these extremely high temperatures are um, above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And I should note that these are temperature data all taken from our outdoor research station that's in the shade. If you're out in the forest and in a sunny spot, temperatures can be um, up to 115, 120 during these um, late parts of the dry season. So as I mentioned, these, are, these lemurs that I'm studying are highly arbore arboreal. They're um, amazing at, at leaping around in the trees. And for most of my time researching them, I am in the forest up like this with my binoculars looking at the lemurs uh, living their life in the trees. Um, so it was really curious when we, my team and I started to see the lemurs spending significant amounts of time on the ground engaged in this um, terrestrial tree hugging behavior where they're sitting on the ground and kind of wrapping their arms and legs uh, around the base of a tree. And so these animals, while they are hi highly arboreal, they do spend some time feeding on the ground and occasionally they will move terrestrially, uh, but it's very rare to see them resting on the ground. So this was with behavior that hasn't been uh, reported before in the scientific literature and we really wanted to figure out what's going on here. And not only was this perplexing because the lemurs are, you know, really adapted to life in the trees, they are also at increased risk for predation on the ground. So this is the Fusa, uh, one of the lemurs' natural terrestrial predators in Madagascar. And uh, the Fusa can climb trees and, and get lemurs when they're in the trees, but they're more agile on the ground. Um, and so likely the lemurs are at higher risk for predation by Fusa when they're resting on the ground. And uh, they're also at risk for being um, predated on by uh, wild cats in the forest, as well as domestic dogs. So as I said, we'd been watching these sea pacas for uh, months, um, mostly in the trees. And so we're kind of astonished to see them hanging out on the ground, sometimes for very long periods of time, doing this tree hugging behavior. So our question was why? We wanted to know uh, what was driving this behavior. Um, and so when we first started to see this, I mentioned we had been watching the sea focus for months, never saw this sort of behavior. And then it starts popping up kind of in this late part of the dry season when temperatures are quite high. So our guess was potentially this is a behavior that's related to thermoregulation. So maybe it's um, somehow allowing the sea focus to um, help regulate their body temperatures behaviorally when, um, when air temperatures are so high. 
So there's this known vertical temperature gradient. Um, so because heat rises um, higher in the forest canopy it tends to be much hotter air temperatures than lower down. Um, so on, on the forest floor, you'd likely have much lower temperatures than where the lemurs are typically hanging out higher up in the trees. Um, so this could explain, help explain why the lemurs are hanging out on the ground, but it doesn't really explain why they're actively hugging the trunks of the trees. So we thought likely there's something going on with the tree trunk and maybe that tree trunk is providing an additional cooling benefit to the lemurs. And before we move on to the details of the study, I just want to make two quick notes about Sifaka biology that make these the species particularly interesting um, to look at in terms of how they respond to extreme heat. So as I've already mentioned, these animals are regularly facing extremely high temperatures during certain parts of the year but they also seem to be relatively limited in their physiological abilities to deal with high temperatures. So for humans, um, our physiological responses to high temperatures include things like our blood vessels dilating to then um, help disperse heat from our skin into the surrounding environment. We also um, sweat, which allows us to release heat via evaporative cooling. So the water droplets on our body are evaporating into the air um, and that's allowing us to, um, to release excess body heat. Um, so when I'm in the field and uh, temperatures are above 90, above 100, above 110 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit, sorry, I am um, drinking a whole bunch of water to keep up uh, with the uh, amount of sweat, the amount of water that I'm losing from sweat because I'm sweating profusely um, to keep my body cool in these really high temperatures. But the sea facas, on the other hand, don't have some of those same capabilities. So these animals don't actually regularly drink water. We've never seen the, the sea facas at Beza coming down to the ground to drink out of water sources. They will occasionally lick water off of leaves or off of their own fur um, after it's rained. But uh, for the most part during this long dry season, there is no precipitation. So the only water that the lemurs are getting is from the leaves and the vegetation that they're eating. Um, and in addition to the sea is not drinking water, they also have a very limited ability to engage in evaporative cooling via sweating. Um, so the sea facas, like all other lemurs, their sweat glands are confined just to the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. Um, so that's a relatively limited surface area um, with which to disperse heat via evaporative cooling. In comparison, humans, um, all of us have sweat glands distributed across our entire body surface. Um, so compared to a lemur, I have a lot more surface area um, to help me cool um, via evaporative cooling than a lemur does. And even if a lemur is able um, to sweat a little bit on its hands and feet and um, disperse some heat that way, um, because they're not drinking water, they're at increased risk for dehydration. So if they're losing water because they're sweating on their hands and feet or panting, which they do, um, they do pant when it's really hot out, but Again, they have these little, little tongues. So uh, their tongue and the surface of their mouth that's exposed when they're panting is again, not providing a whole lot of surface area to disperse heat. So we thought that perhaps um, because of these physiological constraints that CFACAs seem to have in terms of their ability to evaporatively cool and respond physiologically to these high temperatures, perhaps they're more reliant on behavioral strategies to regulate their body temperatures during extreme heat. So uh, my team and I were thinking that um, perhaps this, is, this tree hugging behavior is one such behavioral thermoregulatory um, strategy that the animals are using in order to uh, deal with these high temperatures. So if this is the case, we would expect that the sea facas are hugging trees more as temperatures are warmer, and that um, the surface temperature of the base of the tree 
is cooler than the other locations in the micro in their the Cephalocus habitat, and that's why they're pressing themselves up against the base of the tree. So to test these predictions, um, we were studying again these these Cephalocus, um, six different social groups of Cephalocus that we were um, following during full day follows while the animals were active during the day between June and November of 2018. And during that time period, we were recording all instances of tree hugging behavior. We were also recording air temperature throughout the day, as well as the surface temperature at various locations um, in the Cephalocus microenvironment during these tree hugging battles. And I just wanna note here that um, so we observed this behavior, um, it was so unusual and, and we were so curious to know why this was occurring, um, that we wanted to do some sort of pilot study, um, but we were not able to do any sort of invasive study. These animals, again, are critically endangered. Um, it's difficult to get permission to capture them, um, and we didn't want to, you know, invasively implant them with any sort of temperature loggers. Um, we were also kind of constrained to using the equipment that we had with us in the field. Um, so one caveat of this study is that we do not have temperature on the CFACA's, or data on the CFACA's body temperature during these tree hugging bouts, which is ideally something we would like to have in order to answer this question of, is this a thermoregulatory behavior? So we'll come back to that caveat um, in, in a few minutes at the end of the presentation. So what we found is um, we observed 64 different tree hugging bouts um, and all of those tree hugging bouts together totaled almost 33 hours of tree hugging. <laughs> the average length of a, a tree hugging bout is about half an hour, but there's lots of variation and some tree hugging bouts last over four hours, uh, which is really amazing to see these very arboreal lemurs resting on the ground for hours at a time. And as you can see in this graph, um, which shows the average daytime temperature across our study period, daytime temperature is increasing as we move um, farther into this uh, dry season. And each of these dots represents one of our study days. And the days where we saw tree hugging occurring are represented in green. So you can see there are eight days up here when it's quite hot towards the end of the dry season when we observe tree hugging occurring. And so um, this, this is in line with our prediction that tree hugging would be occurring um, more when it's, when it's hotter out. And we can also look at the distribution of tree hugging on a finer scale. So this graph shows the temperature, air temperature, during days when tree hugging occurred. Um, and you can see kind of this typical increase in the morning. Uh, temperatures tend to peak in the early to mid afternoon. And then by the late afternoon, when the Cephalocas are settling in for bed, they go to bed quite early, um, temperatures are starting to fall off here. So if we plot our, um, the frequency of tree hugging bouts, we see that most of these events are occurring in kind of the late afternoon, kind of between 1 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. Um, is when most of these events are occurring, which again matches up with this peak in air temperatures here. So even just our pilot data results um, seem to suggest that Cephalocas do hug trees more um, when it's hotter out. And then to test our second prediction of uh, whether the surface temperature at the base of the tree is actually cooler than any other place in the Cephalocas habitat, we used a um, infrared thermometer. So this is basically like the thermometers they're using to check our temperatures like at airports now. Um, it works by shooting a little laser and the surface that that laser touches um, is the temperature that's being measured. So basically we used this thermometer to measure the temperature at the base of the tree where the Cephalocas is actually um, in contact with. We also measured the temperature one meter up the tree trunk, two meters up the tree trunk, and we also took the temperature data for the ground at the base of the tree, kind of near where the sea was sitting, 
as well as the ground one meter away from the tree. So we wanted to get some ground measurements to kind of tease out whether sea facas are just hanging out on the ground because the ground's cool or is something really different about the base of the tree that, that is making them want to uh, hug the tree. And as we predicted, what we found is that uh, the base of the tree is indeed significantly cooler than any of the other areas in their microenvironment. So even if we compare the base of the tree to one meter up the tree trunk, we can see that on average, the base is uh, about three degrees Celsius or like four or five degrees Fahrenheit cooler than just one meter farther up the tree trunk which is pretty amazing and this this pattern is consistent across the different locations that we that we recorded temperature data for we're all um, consistently higher in temperature compared to the tree base and this is the same with air temperature um, is uh, consistently higher than the base temperature of the trees during these tree hugging bouts so um, just to wrap this section up um, the we do find support for the second prediction that the surface temperature at the base of the tree would be cooler than the other temperature, the other surfaces. Um, and so going back to this caveat of us not having body temperature data for these sea focas, um, this of course, in order to study or in order to say definitively that tree hugging behavior is a means of thermoregulation, we would want to have data on how CFACA's body temperature changes throughout the day um, before and during tree hugging events um, to really be able to say whether the animals are able, are regulating their body temperatures um, using this behavior and whether they're dissipating body heat. But again, we don't have this data for active CFACA as well, they're engaged in tree hugging. But, I would argue that even without that data, um, I think our, our results from this study um, provide pretty convincing evidence that this is very likely a thermoregulatory um, behavior for the CFACA. So if we look at other um, published studies in the literature where researchers have taken um, temperatures of CFACAs that have been captured for other research purposes, we can estimate that the Sifaka's body temperatures are around 37, 38 degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, if we compare that to the average temperature of the bases of the trees that we were measuring um, that the animals are using for tree hugging, those were around 31 degrees Celsius. So this is a significant temperature difference. Um, and that could potentially allow for dissipation of body heat. So heat is always going to flow from hot to cold. Um, so if the CFACA's body temperature is a lot hotter than the trunk of the tree that they're hugging, um, they're going to be able to dissipate body heat into the tree trunk. And if you notice, looking at this picture of the CFACA here, they have this beautiful lush white fur um, that tends to be quite thick, except for on their chest and stomach and inner arms and legs. And those are all the parts of their body that are wrapped around the tree trunk. So with very limited fur on those parts of their body, um, that's increasing the skin to tree trunk contact and potentially helping to facilitate heat transfer from the Sifaka's warm body to the cooler tree trunk. So just to summarize, based on our pilot data, it seems very likely that tree hugging is a means of behavioral thermoregulation. So this is um, a, a way that CFACAs are able to change their behavior um, to help regulate their body temperatures in response to really hot um, ambient temperatures. And our data also suggests that the cool bases of trees are likely providing CFOC as an opportunity to dissipate their body heat when temperatures are really high. And um, perhaps behavioral adjustments like tree hugging um, are especially important for the lemur, lemurs like the CFOC as who have um, potentially limited abilities um, for evaporative cooling. And so just to conclude, um, 
I talked about how how my my own research um, is mostly uh, related to conservation biology and thermoregulation, thermal physiology is never something I expected um, to be researching. Um, but I became so interested in it because of this interesting lemur behavior. Um, and and once my team and I saw this, the CFOC is hugging trees, we really, really wanted to know why. And um, that that inspired us to conduct this study. Um, and since starting this research, I've become increasingly interested in thermoregulation. And I think um, better understanding how animals are able to cope with extreme temperatures and especially how they're able to cope with extremely hot temperatures um, is increasingly important because as we all know, our earth is warming um, and over the next century, we're gonna have a lot warmer, higher temperatures um, that we're all gonna have to be uh, dealing with. So if we can better understand how animals are able to cope with um, extreme heat now, um, potentially that can be useful for um, helping to uh, figure out how, how these animals can be sustained as the climate warms. Um, and especially, especially for an animal like the sea falca that's already listed as critically endangered, um, this, this kind of research becomes increasingly important and critical um, moving forward. So I'd just like to end with a huge thank you to my collaborators in Zara Raha Rinoro, uh, Dr. Richard Lawler and Dr. Allison Richard, um, who have been just so central to this project and, and helping figure out this whole story. Also a big shout out to the team at Beza Mahafali. Um, they are just the most fantastic field crew you could ever imagine. Um, none of this would have been possible without them. And I'm just so thankful for both their research help, um, but also for keeping me happy and smiling and sane, even during the super hot temperatures and, and the days when I was having trouble thermoregulating myself. And of course, a big, a big thank you to our funding sources that let us um, be in the field for extended periods of time and Madagascar National Parks and the School of Agronomy at the University of Tana in Madagascar are the co-directors of Beza Mahapali Special Reserve um, and permitted us to do this research. And of course, thank you all for listening. Um, I, hope you, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you have some interesting questions and I, I'd be happy to take questions. Well, Chloe, thank you so much. That was that was fantastic. Really interesting to uh, to not only learn about these uh, wonderful lemurs, but to see the images um, and see such a beautiful study that was inspired just by observation. I mean, that's the one of the beauties of doing research is that while you're doing your research, sometimes you notice things that that then inspire these other questions. So really cool. Um, you know, th this um, relates to one of the questions that's already in, but I, I was I was wondering, and I think other people were as well, um, if this is likely to be actually new behavior, or if it's more likely to be um, something that these lemurs have been doing for uh, for quite a while, but nobody's ever really sort of noticed or or uh, you know followed sort of followed it you know and if it one of the questions that came in was is it possible that global warming is is sort of causing this behavior and, and it's never really been noticed before because it's never been hot enough maybe so yeah what what's your thought on those things yeah that those are all great questions so um I'm sure the Sifakas and other animals have been doing this. It just hasn't been um, studied or published on. Um, certainly the people in Madagascar have been observing this um, and, and we're like, oh yeah, you know, the Sifakas are hugging the trees. I was just, you know, um, very curious about it as an academic, not having ever read anything um, published about that. So um, I think the animals have been doing this uh, for quite some time. I know um, Allison Richard, who's worked at Beza for many decades now, um, has seen this behavior. So I don't think it's something new, though I wouldn't be surprised if lemurs are doing this more now that temperatures are increasing. That's fair. Yeah, that, that, that 
that makes good sense. Um, so another question that 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 I was thinking about and um, came in from uh, Mariona and Matteo, six and four years old respectively. Um, mm -hmm. Do do any other animals slash primates do this? That is a great question. Um, so other species of lemur do seem to do this, though again, there aren't published reports of this. Um, but I have a very dear friend and colleague who does research at the Duke Lemur Center, which is a fantastic facility in North Carolina. Um, you can go see lemurs there. Um, she, she was telling me that just yesterday when it was very, very hot in North Carolina, basically all of the lemurs were tree hugging in some capacity. So some were sitting on the ground like our sea facas and, and hugging the bases of trees. Others were hu hugging lo wet logs um, that wow. were cooler. Um, so yeah, and actually um, the, the other published study on tree hugging behavior, I do have a slide on this because I, I thought someone might, might ask, is with koalas. So when koalas are doing this, they're not on the ground, they're higher up in the trees, but they're still kind of hugging a branch of a tree. And so this is a thermal image. Um, so it shows the environment um, and kind of rough temperatures for the environment. So these cooler colors are representing cooler temperatures and the brighter yellow are hot, hotter places in the environment. So you can see even just um, within, the, within the tree trunk and branches, there's some significant variation in temperature. And it seems like these spots where uh, a big branch meets the trunk of the tree tend to be much cooler. And so the koalas tend to, tend to go there and hug that branch or hug that part of the tree trunk when it's really hot out. So yeah. other animals do do this. I wouldn't be surprised if um, many more were out there that are doing it. I've tried it myself, but I can't quite feel the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's great. Um, so there's there's a lot of questions about um, a, a, a lot of questions in general, but there's two questions that have already come in, and then you kind of alluded to it here. So let's just go to um, a question a little bit maybe more from the botany perspective. Uh, why do we have any idea why the base of the tree is the coolest part? And then actually in the image you just showed, it, it were the, they were the, like the crooks of the trees where branches come out. Like botanically speaking, have, have you or anybody else looked into what makes those spots on the tree cooler? Yeah, so that is a great question and something I've thought a lot about. I'm obviously not a botanist, <laughs> um, and we have you know so many so many ideas for follow up studies for this, and would love to get some sort of plant physiologist on board. Um, what I think is probably going on is that as trees are sucking up water in their roots from the ground, um, that is going to be the the water is going to be cooler as it's closer to the ground and kind of in the base of the tree trunk um, compared to when it when it gets farther up in the tree so um, I think that's a pretty good um, potential explanation for why the the base of the tree is cooler but I'm not sure what's going on kind of in those those tree um, crooks uh, with yeah. uh, where the branch meets the trunk but that that thermal image was fantastic, and it made it very clear where where that tree was cooler. So that that was nice to see. Yeah, um, yeah, that study that study is amazing. Here, I'll I'll put it up one more time. Um, yeah, you can look it up. The citation is right here. Oh, great. Um, and yeah, really cool. I hope we can get some thermal cameras out to Beza and get some similar images with this. Yeah, one. well, good. I look forward to seeing that. Um, while we're on trees, just a follow up question: Does the um, Saskia asks, does the type or age of tree affect the temperature? Uh, for example, would new forest that has regrown after logging or another invasive activity be less able to cool lemurs than older, larger trees? Great, that's a great question. Thank you, Saskia. Um, so you can see, even just from the few pictures that I showed, this, this is obviously quite a big tree um, with multiple lemurs around it, probably quite an old tree. Um, but some of the animals like, like this, in this picture, that's a much skinnier, uh, younger tree. And it seems like uh, the lemurs certainly have a, seem to have a preference for tree species. And I think um, 
that's potentially due to different differences in tree physiology between species. Um, they also tend to prefer uh, the tree trunks that have smooth bark, uh, which could potentially just be more comfortable, or maybe um, the more roughed bark trees are have more of like warm air kind of in those furrows of the tree tree bark that is making this temperature differential uh, less extreme. But I think that's a great question and something that we couldn't tackle with our small sample size from this pilot data. But if we can get more more data on the, this behavior and um, and actually collect data about the different characteristics of the trees besides just uh, what species they are um, would be really fantastic because obviously that relates to other sorts of conservation issues and um, what's going on when deforestation is happening and, and new forests are um, growing up potentially after uh, reforestation efforts. So thank you and while just well, we'll stick with trees just a tiny bit longer and, and maybe you said this already, but someone asks if you noticed a, an, any preference for, for tree species that the Sifakas were hugging. Yes. Um, so again, we had relatively small sample size. There were only 64 events that we saw of this. And um, there, there were, I think, maybe 14 different tree species that they, they were using oh, during wow. those events. Okay. Um, but they did seem to be preferring certain trees. So in this picture, they're all hugging a certain species that's called Tanzica in Malagasy um, that tend to have relatively small trunks. Um, and so in this picture, obviously, each lemur has its own little tree hugging spot. Um, and yeah, I think I think with a bigger sample size, we could really get at uh, these differences in, in tree species. And I think that would be interesting because if if they're really preferring maybe three different species of tree, um, potentially that makes uh, a good argument for really focusing conservation efforts on those tree species as important um, important components of thermoregulation in this extreme environment. Excellent. And in fact, that to the person who asked that question, that was sorry that I didn't say the full question, but there that was the second part of their question that you just answered. So thank you. Um, all right. So Lizzie would like to know if baby lemurs hug trees or only adults. Um, mostly adults uh, hug trees, though, Lizzie, you can tell, and I'm going to scroll back to um, this last picture where the three lemurs are hugging the tree. You can see, if you look closely, there's a baby lemur right here. So baby lemurs tend to ride on their mom's belly or on their mom's back, depending on how old they are. Um, so this baby is um, just hanging out on, on her mom like usual while her mom is hugging the tree. But, but once that baby gets bigger and is at one year old next year, um, when, when these hot temperatures are occurring, um, she will very likely engage in tree hugging too. Great. Um. Diana asks, are there any other possible reasons for tree hugging? Yeah, um, I mean, again, our study isn't like totally conclusive that, that this is thermoregulation. Um, you know, there's always the possibility that these animals just, you know, they love trees and <laughs> uh, they're hugging trees for the same reason that some of us do. Um, but I think uh, kind of one of the more, more technical explanations is perhaps Perhaps the effect of just having cooler air closer to the ground, um, perhaps that's enough um, for the animals uh, just to be um, a little bit lower in the forest strata than they typically are. And maybe they're in contact with the tree just because that, that keeps them safe. If a predator does come, they're already poised to jump up into, up the tree trunk and into the tree. Um. I guess we'll we'll stick with the predatory comment here. Another question that came in is, did you or your team witness any predatory attacks during tree hugging episodes? We did not, um, though the lemurs very easily get scared when they're on the ground. So typically when they're up in the trees, they're very well habituated to our presence um, and just don't even think about us. So. Um, 
we try not to get very close to them. Um, but even if, if we do accidentally, uh, they'll just kind of look at us and be like, well, whatever. Uh, but when they're on the ground, things are very different and the, they're a lot more skittish. So um, at Beza, where I work, this is a community, community reserve that has multiple different kind of conservation areas. And some of those areas of the forest are um, used by the local community there. Uh, they'll graze their livestock in the forest, and oftentimes livestock herds are accompanied by both a person and a dog or multiple dogs. And the lemurs are very scared of dogs because dogs can um, attack and kill them. Okay. And so occasionally when we hear um, dogs either barking or oftentimes the lemurs will know there's a dog around before I do, um, they will immediately go up the tree um, and, and tree hugging is over. <laughs> okay. Got it. All right. Um, I think why don't we, we why don't we have two more questions? We just have a little time left. Uh, here's a here's a technical one. If you can measure the temperature of a tree remotely, why can't the same technology be used to measure the temperature of the lemur? Yes, great question. Um, so the laser basically measures exactly what it touches. So if I shine it at the sepaka's back right here, it's going to be measuring the temperature of the fur which is probably a lot different than the, the body temperature of the animal. So just like when we measure our, our body temperatures with those uh, similar thermometers, we're not taking the temperature of our hair, we're taking the temperature in an area where it's highly vascularized mm -hmm. and it's gonna be close, a closer representation of our core body temperatures. So potentially we could use the thermometer and you know, point it at the Sifaka's face where they have, um, exposed skin, though it's a laser, and I didn't want to risk shining it in their eyes. So we didn't do that. Um, but there are also other ways. Um, there are some, some collars that measure body temperature. Um, but basically, and any of those ways, uh, besides the thermal cameras, would require capturing the lemurs, which we didn't want to do at this point in the study. Oh, that's a great, uh, it's, it's good for, yeah, it, some of us hadn't, I'm sure hadn't thought about the fact that the fur is, is going to be, the outer part of the fur is going to be a very different temperature. So that's, that's good. Uh, well, so one more question here. Um, this is from Daniel. Do you see a lot of competition for favored tree hugging spots, especially on extremely hot days, or is tree hugging an amiable group activity? Yeah, there are definitely favorite spots. Um, and so uh, going back to that uh, big group tree hugging picture, um, this, is, this is one of our social groups, Group Papuzi, who this is their favorite spot. When it's hot out, we know in the morning they're gonna be going here because this is the best tree hugging spot in their territory. And that's where they're gonna be hanging out. Um, and it just so happens this group is relatively small. They each get their own tree and there doesn't have to be a whole lot of fighting. But um, like this example, this is a nice big tree in um, one of the group's ranges that there aren't a whole a lot of other trees in this, in this section of the forest. So you can see it's like grassy, tangly, and sunny, hot around this tree. Um, so the select few that are able to hug this tree get the benefit while the others are left out. And something interesting about lemurs is that the females are dominant. Um, and so that means that the girls get the first choice of tree hugging spots. And uh, if a male has found a good tree hugging tree and is hugging it, uh, he is very likely to be quickly, you know, chased after and displaced by the dominant female and she'll take over that spot. Okay. All right. Well, fantastic. Chloe, you've given us a, a really wonderful story here on a Friday afternoon to send us into a, a for, for what will be for most people, a long weekend here. Um, so I want to thank you uh, tremendously from the Peabody Museum and, uh, and say thanks to everybody who attended today. As I mentioned before, we are recording this and we intend to post it on our YouTube channel and also on our Peabody at Home webpage if you want to watch it again or watch a part of it or let somebody else know that it's there. Um, for those who are attending and still on the webinar, uh, please do follow us on social media and join. Uh, you know, join our email list so you can find out when more of these are happening. Um, 
and uh, our hope is that uh, this year they're all just as as engaging and, and wonderful as Chloe's. So um, with that, I want to thank you again and uh, bid everyone farewell. So Thanks thank so you, much, Chloe. everybody. Have a great weekend. All right. Bye, everyone.